Hello, 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 everybody. It is so good to see all of your digital non-existent faces in the chat. <laughs> Welcome to this incredible, very special one shot of God killer glass, all lowercase with a period. This is an immensely, <laughs> immensely special game that I am so freaking honored and privileged and excited to share with the world. So thank you all so much for being here. God killer would not be possible without the support of all of you beautiful queer trans heretics. So if you don't already know, if you're here just for Jess and Sefi, uh, uh, then God Killer is an original holy punk PBTA game created by yours truly, built to tell the story of one player here, Jess, the God Killer, and one game master here, Sefi, the God <laughs> of Gods. Yes. Together, the God and God Killer will weave a mythic, violent, and transformative tale about a single mortal rising against the challenges of of the divine. If that sounds interesting to you, then pre-orders for the Ashcan edition of God Killer are open now. So nab your own copy while they're still on sale and be ready for the release in June. So you can use exclamation point God Killer in chat to get your very own act of heresy. If you're here and you're wondering who the heck is this person talking to me right now? Hello, I am Connie. My pronouns are they, he and she. I am the uh, creative producer of this channel that you're watching this one shot on right now, Transplaner RPG, which is an all transgender people of color led dark fantasy TTRPG show set in an original non-colonial anti-orientalist multiverse. We're currently between main campaigns, so this one-shot is a part of seven one-shots uh, and hiatus content on Transplanar RPG to bridge that gap. They are incredible in their own right. Speaking of which, Sefi, would you like to introduce yourself as our god for the evening? No. <laughs> Just kidding. Hi, I'm <laughs> Sefi, aka Persephone, aka Persephiroth. And I'll be playing a number of deities this evening that we will be encountering, though two important ones. Um, uh, there's also some uh, other things to go over before we start, but first, let's introduce Jess. Hi, everybody. I'm Jess. I'm playing your god killer. I mean, we'll see. We'll see. The goal is to kill the god. Um, and uh... Kill me! <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to be here. This is very exciting. Heck yeah. Sefi, speaking of which, I think you had some quick announcements. I'm gonna we have a, we have I, a script backstage that we, I'm we, we totally have a script that yeah, yeah. Connie has completely deviated from. And so <laughs> bleh, it's fine. It's whatever. So the announcements are every Saturday from now through the end of May, Transplaner is gonna be hosting shows like this, God Killer one shots, right here. Um, so there's seven total. I don't know how many are, we've done so far, but um, every single participant is like a big deal in TTRPGs. And the next one I'm super excited for because Lexi, also known as Black Girl Mage, is going to be running it with Josephine McAdam, both of whom are great friends of mine and are very talented. Lexi's been my GM before. I've played in games with her before. So like definitely go check that game out next week. Um, that will be a game where the God Killers fight fighting for vengeance against a god of disease in an urban setting, like an urban fantasy setting, like Constantine or so. Yeah, and we Jess. also have some incredible sponsors for this God Killer one-shot series. As you can see from this gorgeous overlay, we're using Roll to bring you the stream series, and it has never been easier to customize your games online than with this awesome VTT. And I'm I'm in the back end. It's beautiful. It looks awesome. It's pretty slick. I'm, I'm excited to use it. Yeah, it's really mm -hmm. cool. Um, so make sure you use uh, the command sponsors in chat to start running your games on roll and get some info on our other sponsors, Start Playing and Magpie Games. Cool. Finally, God Killer. This is the part y'all want to pay attention to. Like, this is where the content warnings come. So like, don't say I didn't warn you. Some of these will repeat because I'm, they're going to be there a lot. Okay. So God Killer is a dark fantasy series that contains content that may be triggering to some viewers. Content warnings include fantasy violence, gore, body horror, death and killing, death of loved ones, abusive and toxic relationships, domestic horror, pregnancy and miscarriage, important, forced transformations, loss of autonomy, jail themes such as imprisonment, no police stuff, but just like imprisonment, torture, blood, gaslighting, vengeance, and potentially insects or spiders. Use exclamation point CW in chat anytime to get a full list of these content warnings. Thank you. And so uh, anything else, Connie? Nope, uh, that's actually my uh, sign to exit. So I'm gonna fade into the background and let Sefi and Jess take you all on a grim, uh, dark, gothic, you know what? I'll let Sefi tell you. So <laughs> peace and we'll enjoy.
You ready? I'm ready. Let's do this. Allow me to tell you a tale with a beginning and as of yet, no end. A tale that starts with verdant fields nestled between mountains, lush and green, birthed from the soil of what would come to be known as the land of Sai. It was beautiful and beauty, as you will all learn, is a great and terrible burden. Two gods wanted to claim this land for themselves, equal in magnitude, Lyra, whose domain would become beauty, and Egan of desire. They fought for this land until its beauty grew scarce, fields burned to ash, and the corpses of mortals were cast like seeds across the embers. But a truce was created. The beauty of the land would belong to Lyra, whose bright arms brought fresh life to the ashes. But the people, the mortals with their madcap desires and longings and passions, those were Egan's alone. At the center of this truce is a bride, a mortal chosen, fostered and birthed on the land cradled in Lyra's arms and given to Egan. Every 20 years, a new bride is given, affirming the link between the two and the bride is never seen by mortals again. One such bride is about to begin her own tale. And for this story with no end, one may just be fast approaching. Elwyn, you are in a dark carriage with no windows, no light. You can't even see your hands in front of your face. All you can hear are the sounds of the crack of a whip against a horse's back, the tremble of wheels on cobblestone, and your own breath. How are you feeling in this moment, knowing where you're about to go? Terrified, but at the same time, withdrawn and um, resigned to my fate because I didn't have a choice in this. And there is no one left back in Thistle who has any love for me. So right now it's a matter of teetering between my will to live and survive and whether or not that's something worth doing. The carriage found you at midnight in silence, appearing from the mists outside the skirts of town. No rider, no one to hold the whip, and only a single pale horse with gloss over eyes that looked like sea glass. Soon, now, the carriage stops and you feel a strange sort of thrum in the air. And beside you, the door to the carriage opens and wan misty light passes through the doorway. Um. What am I wearing as I step out of the carriage? You tell me. Well, I think the townsfolk of Thistle have done their best to please this god, and the best dressmakers, which are just simple merchants, have put all the resources together to put her in something grand, and it's not the grandest thing you've ever seen, but it is a gown of sorts, um, all black. And while the town is not rich enough to be able to add any kind of gemstones to this dress, it is embroidered with great care. And they've had 20 years to, um, to work on this dress and this piece of art. So it is, it is beautiful, but simple. 
as far as the gods might be concerned. And prepare they did, despite not knowing who would go for the last 20 years until someone special, or shall we say someone unfortunate, became special. Do you exit the carriage? I do, but not before checking that my bracers are secure on my arms beneath the long sleeves of my dress. Your bracers are. Why don't you describe what your bracers look like for our audience? Um, the bracers are a very simple gold um, with runes and symbols etched in them that make no sense to Elwyn. Um, and they seem to thrum with a power that um, shoots through Elwyn's bones with every step, allowing her to walk upright, to move physically as anybody else in her village might, um, which is new to her and very empowering to her. But that's, that's all. As you check the bracers and your fingers rest upon the metal, you hear behind you, inside you, it's hard to tell, a whisper of words that you can't quite understand, but eventually you make out the words, don't look back. Okay, I won't. Elowen or Elwyn, you exit the carriage and behold a foreign sight. You are standing at the entryway of a grand manor. Tall columns shifting between white, silver, gray, purple, blue stand in front of you, guarding the lines of what seems like an iron wrought fence, but the metal is transparent, but still reflective. Beyond it, you can see a towering castle made of crystal, bricks of cut stones, precious, that rise above you in tall towers that split into a green sky. And how far from the castle am I? Is it a long walk? It's not a long walk, no. Maybe okay. five minutes. Because Ellen is used to wearing sturdy leather boots that have that she's worn her entire life, and now she's in heels, something that she has no practice walking in. So she gingerly takes step by step towards the castle, stealing herself for whatever is to come next. Your heels clack on crystal cobblestones as you stand before the gate to this incredible palace. And with a groan, the gates open, welcoming you in, or about to seal you in. Ellen takes a slight move to look back towards the carriage the carriage and is then gone. Remembers that she can't look back, but she feels that the carriage is gone. Mm. Well, the only way back is through. Mm -hmm. You walk through the gate as you do. Spires of light pierce up at the sides of the path, one by one by one, lighting the winding path up to the front door of the palace. At the end of it, you see a single figure, a tall woman with a cloud of coiled white hair wound with ribbons. Roses adorn both her hair and her dress. 
which is as white as snow, frothing with lace. Hello, you must be. Alabaster, my dear. Alabaster, are you one of the, mm -hmm. the brides? One of. Um, am I, am I dressed presentably? She regards you with sleepy eyes, half-lidded. Her irises are completely opaque, the same color as the horse's green sea glass with no pupil. It will do, but you'll have no lack of finery here. Does she look dead or like she's from beyond? She does not look dead, but she looks unlike any mortal you've ever seen. Okay. Does she still look mortal even, or, or does she look like she's beyond mortal? To you, beyond mortal. Okay. Um, with the juxtaposition of uh, inky dark skin and white hair and the outfits and garments that she's wearing, she seems foreign in more ways than one. Alabaster, could you tell me what what's going to happen now? No one in the village knows. No, they wouldn't. I am here to be your first guide, to welcome you into the Palace of Desire. She snaps her fingers and with a groan, the gate slams shut. The lights on the path dim one by one and the door behind her opens. Come now. Okay. And she, she uh, I, I look around to see if there's any other any other people here it's just or it's just alabaster not even any other people there's no sound no mm. crickets no bugs not even a gust of wind mm. it is completely silent save for your breath <sighs> alabaster holds out a hand for you to take Elwyn tries to keep her hand from shaking, but does not succeed in doing so as she reaches it out. Nerves are natural. They won't change. Not even if I live here for the rest of my life? What is life but a fleeting series of moments easily forgotten? never changed. I guess I'll find out what life is beyond, what life is here, but a part of me hopes that it might not be as painful as my life was. And she looks down at her hand that she's still outstretching towards Alabaster and sees that her nails are brittle and short and cracked away. There's calluses on her hands from working with her father. And her skin is dry. There's nothing delicate about her hand that she's holding out in stark contrast to Alabaster. Alabaster's palm is cool against her hand. She notes the calluses and turns her unblinking stare to meet your eyes. No bride is the same when they arrive. She drops her hand. Follow me. She leads you up and through the door. Inside there is a massive hallway dark lacquered wood floors, stone walls, glittering 
with tiny flecks of crystal inside them. As you walk forward, a brazier erupts into purple and green light against the wall, and then another and another. To the left and right, there are massive crystal doors carved with images that you would recognize from the church in your town. But instead of being in stained glass, they are in carved crystal. The images of brides depicting the deal between the god Lyra of beauty and Aegon of desire. And it is the latter you know is the home that you are now located in. At the front of the path at the very end, there are even larger doors that rise one, two stories up, carved with the shape of a rose in it, semi-transparent. You can hear as you get closer, conversation, see dancing lights beyond. Alabaster pauses right before the door and looks back at you. You are to meet Aegon now. Alabaster, will it... Will it... hurt? Everyone is... is, is terrified of... of being sent to Aegon, to... to the gods. They have... as you know, not been kind at all times to us. I just, I would rather know now. A contemplative look crosses her face and then a small frown. There is no end to pain here, Elwyn. Elwyn, reaches down and, and subtly feels for her bracers, which give her some kind of comfort thinking that perhaps there is a reason that she's here. Perhaps there is a reason she was chosen and hopefully she's different. Are you ready? I don't think I ever will be, but Let's go. She turns and looks at the door and as if responding to her glance, it opens. You walk into a massive antechamber, rows and rows and rows of high rise seating, up story, two stories, three stories, all made out of the same crystal that you saw outside green, purple, blue, light shifting across it. And there are hundreds, if not thousands of people. Your eyes shift from one to another, to another, to another. And in your core, deep down, where as sure as you know that you are Elwyn, that that is your name, you know that these are brides. How many of you are there? Oh, the pastor frowns. How can there possibly be this many? As you look across the room, you look at these brides and some of them seem more mortal than others. You see a woman with long braided blonde hair, wearing an extremely old gilded gown, something that you would have only seen in history books or scrolls, low cut in the front with long trailing sleeves. And then there are others, as you look further up, ones that you look at, and as soon as you glance away, you can't remember what they looked like. Even more others was too bright to look at that hurt your eyes but you know they're there. Some that seem more elemental than mortal. 
living beings of flame, statues of ice. Each one is different in their own way. At the center, towards the back, on a dais with stairs leading up to it, is a single throne. And on it sits Egan. This is your first time seeing the God of Desire close. And the magnitude of his power fills you, threatening to crush you. The weight of it impossible to bear. His silver hair and long braids, dark skin, silver eyes, purple pupils. He wears a long brocade coat of silver and black, multicolored rings on each of his fingers. He raises two fingers and beckons you. All the brides fall silent and you feel the weight of their stares upon you. Ellen takes a deep breath and begins to walk forward, noting how loud her heels suddenly seem in this space. The swish of a fraying hem at the bottom of her dress. How plain she is, how mortal she is, with all of these eyes staring at her. And Egan, would you say that he is the most beautiful creature that Elwyn has seen, or is it more frightening? He is the most beautiful creature you've ever seen, and because of that, he is terrifying. Elwyn doesn't say a word as she walks closer and closer until his beckoning hand stops motioning for her. Stops at the steps and he rises. He is tall, the tallest man you've ever seen. And each step he takes towards you, there is no earthquake or shock wave, a shattering of stone, but each step hits your body was a silent thunder until he finally stops before you and looks down at you. You are Elwyn, or Elwyn, are you not? I am. The latest offering in the village of Thistle. Yes, a last minute choice. He pauses. He looks at Alabaster, who has silently followed you and stands a few feet away. Alabaster will see to your needs and introduce you to the palace. Am I, am I to remain here for a millennia? A millennia is but a spit in the cup of the time you will have here. And then the weight of all his power crashes into you, knocking you onto your knees, and then onto your hands, and then flush against the ground. 
you hear a rattling hum, the voices of all the brides piercing the air, shattering like glass. And in your head, you hear a voice, not Agin's, but somehow familiar, that says, you will never leave this cage of desires. That is your curse. Elle says in her head back to this voice as she's careening against the floor, grasping at, 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 at anything to try to upright herself, but unable to do so as this power is thundering her down. And, and, and what if I don't want it? What if I don't, what if I, what if I want to leave? The mortal realm was, was painful, but, but this is unfathomable. Your desires are secondary here. We'll see about that. And once again, she strains against the power to try and upright herself to at least get on her elbows, fighting against the power. Inside you, starting from your feet, rising up through your legs, through to your chest, and then to your hands, you feel something opposing the weight of the power upon you, a sort of golden warmth that spreads through you. And the weight of the mantle that Egan has upon you starts to shift, not completely gone, but as if it's been shouldered to one side off of you. And you can once again rise. Okay, so she shakily does so. She gathers that strength bit by bit, limb by limb, and tries to stand with this, these golden threads of power that she can feel running through her. As you stand, you see something strange happen to Aegon's face. The one consistency that you would have seen since you entered the room and saw him is that his expression was flat, as if carved in marble and set for an eternity. But something like surprise washes over his face for but a moment, lips parting, jaw slightly slack, and then it is gone. The voices of the brides clatters to silence. Hmm. Well, every bride has her own ability and her own strengths to bring here. I suppose you, though seemingly different in some manner, are just more of the same. He turns his back and you feel the rest of the weight leave you. <sighs> My palace is a cage, a jail of desire, my own. He sits upon the throne. As such, it will exert its will upon you. Because of this strange ability that Elwyn has now found to stand up for herself, something that she has never done, and now it is against this dark power, she somehow musters up the courage to say, and of this desire, would it not, would it not be more pleasurable if both were to desire 
Because as far as I can see, this is a beautiful castle. Beautiful roses, beautiful people. But the desire seems to lie in just you. Where is the desire for me, for anybody else here? He raises a single silver brow. Blinks once. And then looks to Alabaster. Show her to her quarters. Elwyn lets Alabaster lead her away. Alabaster takes your hand and turns you towards the exit. And when you turn, you see that every seat in the amphitheater is empty. Where did they go? Where they have it here in the palace, my dear. Summoned in and summoned out at Egan's whim. You are welcome to think so. Is that not the case? Nothing is simple here, young one. If you can learn a single lesson this day, let it be that one. As, as they're walking, um, Elwyn will continue to question Alabaster and say, so you don't, you don't want to escape. You, you are here now of your own volition or, or you are prisoner. I don't understand what's happening. Every 20 years, someone is sent here against their will and now everyone is just content. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. This has to end. It has to end with me. <laughs> you would fight against the whim of the gods. I have there have been lose. many like you come here who have not accepted their fate. Some things become easier with acceptance. But if you truly believe that everyone in this palace or anyone is content. You are a fool. Egan said the truth. This palace is a gilded cage of crystal and desire. So help me. Help me end it. Do you not want it to end? There are some things that mortal hands cannot alter. I think you underestimate them. For what is a god without power over mortals? There's some balance to be struck. This deal that was made with mortals. <laughs> what happens when it ends? Her laughter tinkles through the hallway, bouncing off crystal brazier to crystal brazier, the flames burning slightly brighter. You will soon learn, young one, the youngest bride in the palace, the most mortal of us all, that the things that we were taught in the outside world are but the perspective of a mortal. Here, I'm afraid you'll learn much more than you ever wanted to know.
Well, I don't know much. So it looks like I have a lot to learn. Come with me. I'll show you to your quarters. Alabaster leads you through one of the side doors in the hallway and up a massive spiral staircase of transparent glass. Up one floor, another floor, another floor. Until you come to a door on the third floor. She opens it and a long hallway greets you. She leads you past crystal door of crystal door, each one with a different symbol, a rose here, a marigold here, each one a different flower, and stops before one with a lily. This is to be your room. Is there a significance to the, the different flowers here? They somewhat represent the women who occupy them. And does Egan visit these chambers at any time he wishes? Sometimes. Alabaster, what's, what's next? I don't know what to do. And I have no belongings. You will have nothing to want for here. That I assure you. Other than my free will? Yes, other than that. You will have free reign over every section of the palace. I suggest you become acquainted with it. I am to serve as your guide here as many others have guided. Do you have a library? We do. Elwyn looks around the chambers that she's been shown to. And, you open the door? Uh, oh yeah, the door's not open yet, yeah. yeah. You walk in and Unlike the wan light of the rest of the palace, this is filled with a brightness. There is a crystal orb that hangs at the center of the room that has the brightness of moonlight. And it casts a glow over tiled floors overlaid with carpet, fur, a white bed for a poster, silken, bread silken bedspread, a mirror on the far left side. The room will change as the palace grows accustomed to who you are and who you're meant to be within its walls. Who I'm meant to be? She nods. What are you meant to be? She pauses. I am the white. What does that mean? The white? The opposite of my sister, the black. We were both taken. Were you taken? How long has this compromise, as they call it, been in place? The sheer number of brides that are here for, I mean, it, they can't all be from Thistle. They can't all be from, from one, one place. The, the elementals that I saw, or whatever they were, I don't, I've never seen anything like it. The, the brides made of, of ice. Every bride that you saw, and I will tell you, 
that was not all of them, is transformed by the palace and its desires. I did not arrive at the palace in this form. And just as you are the most mortal of us, soon you too will begin to change. I don't want to. I don't, I don't want to change. Do you hear that? House, castle, room? And she looks into the mirror across the room at her own reflection. Do you hear me? I don't, I don't want to change. You look into the mirror at your own reflection, your own pale face in this finery that was thrust upon you as the purpose of a sacrifice to dress you in garb suiting a deity. The bracers on your hands. And you feel a steeliness come to you, a straightening of your spine, an adamant desire to not be taken by this place or by this God. And in a moment, you see a flash of a face that is not your own. Dark skin, long, inky black hair, white eyes. His fingertips touch the surface of the mirror, leaving a ripple and then disappear. Did it look like it was, was it moving at the same time as me or was it a totally other form that was moving within the mirror? Totally other form. Okay. That superseded your image. Did it look like Alabaster saw that as well? No. She still stands by the doorway. Well, um, actually, can I want to ask you as the GM, mm -hmm. I, I was going to say, I think I'm hungry now, but I don't know if that's the laws of this place, if I would get hungry. You are hungry. Okay. So she turns to Alabaster and says, well, is there... some sort of fancy dinner that we need to go to later? They're receiving? Or can I eat in here? You may eat wherever you wish, but if you wish to eat in the dining hall, I can take you there. But there will be no grand party. And surprise flickers across Elwyn's face. She was... She has no familiarity with the things that the wealthy do, but there was a part of her that expected there to be some kind of ceremonious thing happening other than the initial um, receiving, but, and it, and it actually, the, <laughs> the shock that Ellen feels surprises her again that she had this expectation, wondering where that could have possibly come from. You and are surprised. I, I, well, we tell stories back in Thistle of mm -hmm. what might happen once we arrive and everybody has a different idea, but I guess we had all assumed the brides are immediately thrown into some sort of ceremony, some, some sort of hateful and torturous celebration. And I find that I'm just taken to what seems to be a comfortable room. Oh. 
Why would one throw a celebration to accept a prisoner? I don't know. I guess that's a mortal's limited understanding of what happens when one accepts a bride. Does no. bride not mean what I assume it means? That you are joined in the bowels of matrimony to Aiken. You are bound to him, as we all are. It is a marriage of sorts. You will never die in this place. You will never know the respite of an afterlife. You are cursed, as we all are, to never leave. No one has ever escaped? No. Are there stories of those who tried? Us. Many have tried. One has tried more than most. Who? Aegon. I'm sorry? Aegon. When I say we are all trapped here for eternity, I meant no exceptions. Is this not Egan's doing? His his deal with Lyra? You will learn in time. But yes, this is Egan's doing. In a way. It is his desires that create the twisted tapestry of this palace. Whether he wants them to or not. I'd like to take my supper in the library, please. Shall I guide you there? Please. She takes you back down the tower and stops on the second floor. The door opens up to a much wider hallway. And at the end of it is another set of doors, almost as large as the antechamber doors. And they're already open, slightly ajar. Alabaster stops at the door, looks at you and says, I will have your supper brought to you. But feel free to explore. Thank you. And she and turns from you. Elwyn yes. pushes the doors open and tries to, um, and, and looks around the library. This library is more massive than the greatest house you've ever seen in your entire life tall spiraling bookshelves all made of crystal books and scrolls reaching high above you farther than you can see it's almost as if there's no roof to the building looking up and looking into the sky hurts so elwyn walks in and is stunned by what she sees. This is almost as shocking as seeing thousands of brides in the receiving room, in the receiving hall. And walks over to the closest um, bookshelf and tries to make sense of how this library is cataloged. Mm -hmm. And um, begins her search to find some kind of book or section on 
the history of the gods, the history of this God. Mm. You start to look at the rows of books. Each one is marked with a symbol, much like the ones on your rune, on your bracers, that you're not fully sure to understand. You pick up one and the writing inside is gilded as if someone wrote in liquid gold. But the letters make no sense to you. Can I help you? <gasps> oh, <sighs> hello. Hi. And what do they look like? This voice, or is it just a voice? <laughs> it's a voice, but when you turn around, you see a very short woman, maybe five feet or so. She has horn rimmed spectacles. Her hair is a color of fresh parchment and ends in pages that trail across the floor as if it's turning into paper. Her skin has writing constantly moving across it, just as white as her hair. Bloody red lips, black eyes. And she smiles at you. You must be the newest bride. I am. My name is Elwyn. I am Lily. Lily? Lily. I have a lily upon my door. You have a marigold upon your door. I have a marigold. Oh. <laughs> okay. Oh, no, wait. Actually, it's a lily. It's a lily. You're right. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Sorry. I messed up. Um, I was... Are you able to read anything in this library? I am ready to read anything that I want. <laughs> that is what this palace has changed me into. Oh, so you're one of the brides. I am. Is everybody here one of the brides? They are. Save for Egan. Um. She has not blinked once. It's unnerving. It's very unnerving to Elwyn. Could I, uh, how do you, this is the biggest library I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> this yes. is the biggest room I've ever seen in my life. Mm. Yes, How it is you... filled with the knowledge that anyone who desired knowledge could want. I would like to read more about the history of Egan. Oh. Mm. About the history of the gods, about... Well, these... Which version would you like? Which version? Mm -hmm. Is there not an agreed upon version? No. Do you want what the mortals know? Do you want the truth? Or do you want the account written by the gods themselves? The accounts written by the gods themselves are not true. She blinks once. It's the first time you've seen her blink. <laughs> no! <laughs> well, to be honest, I... I did not have... schooling um, back in my village, other than my dad teaching me. I'm afraid that I won't be able to read most of what's in this library. Do the you rooms? have the desire to read? I, I do, yes. Then you can read. And uh, Elwyn looks down at the book in her hands. The runes start to shift. The letters changing into words you start to recognize in speech. Everything here is guided by desire. Most of all, Egan's. Some small part ours, but very little. What is it that you desire? The most. I desired to learn. Oh. And then I became knowledge. I became this room. And are you happy? No. Okay. 
Elwyn takes a moment and looks down at her bracers to see if she can read now the runes on her bracers. You can, in fact, read the runes upon your bracers. Ooh. Okay. The runes start to shift and move. And one side says, show me. The other side says, the missing half. Do you have any idea what, what this might mean? And she shows her the bracers. She looks down at them. No! The missing half. I, I, I'm, I'm translating this correctly. Show me the missing half. Uh-huh. <laughs> what are those? Uh, they are bracers that I, well, that I found. Or perhaps they found me. Hmm. Um, I've never seen them before. I think they were sent by a god. I don't think, I don't think Egan knows about them. Or at least what they can do beyond. I don't know what he knows. I stood up to him today. I stood up against his powers and it was from the power of these bracers. And I don't know if, if he knows where that came from. I'm sorry. I don't. I, I, I'm just trying to figure out a way out because that is my desire. I don't want to be caged here. None of us do. So everyone's greatest desire is the one that's not granted. You learn quickly. And then Ellen describes the woman she saw in the mirror. Do you have any information on who this might be in this library? She pauses. If you saw something in the mirror, it must be a bride. We're the only ones that are here. Is there information on all of the brides in this library? Yes. Do you think maybe you could help me find one on her? Does Egan ever come in here? Egan goes where he pleases. I'm just going to sell them here. Okay. Likely we won't be disturbed. I'm just not sure yet what happens when he... To, we, we tell a lot of tales, and I don't know what's true and what's not, but I'm just afraid of what his wrath might be mm. if I'm caught doing something he doesn't want me to do. Does he care at all what we do? No. Do you still desire those two books? Yes. She raises a hand and pop! The puff of air. There are two tomes. One slim, one thick in front of you. She holds them out to you. This is incredible that I can read these. And uh, she flips through and tries to find any information on who the bride is that she saw in the mirror. Okay, let's see. I think it might be time for a mortal move. Oh, okay. um, Let's see which one. Okay. I think you should maybe try to feel someone or something out. Okay. So... And which book are you looking at? One is the le one is the legend or the background of what is going on. Um, and the other is a record of all the brides that are in the palace. The um, thicker tome, rather. I will look at the um the brides, the book about the brides. Cool. And what are you specifically looking for? Um 
to see if I can find uh, what the history was or the story is of, of the bride who I saw in the mirror. You start to flip through. The book is in black and white, but each page is a different bride and has a different portrait, a sort of cameo of them in side profile, the few notes. You flip through, you flip through. It's in alphabetical order and eventually you pass your own name. Do you what look at the say? page? Yeah. Elwyn of Thistle, to be determined. <laughs> hmm. Nothing in here about my education or my father. Okay. You think of your father. You start to remember. As you flip through the pages, your mind starts to drift back to that day that cursed you to be present in this palace. The bracers you found gave you the ability to walk again after your sickness, but they also cost you the only person who ever loved you. You can still remember the smell of the blackened wood, the light that burst from you, smell of searing and cooking human meat, mm. blood. Your father, nothing more than a charred corpse. As she remembers those details, the book falls from her hands and she falls to her knees and she holds herself gasping for air, nausea rising in her throat. I'm, uh, Lily, I, I'm sorry. I, um, I, I, I need to go back to my room. I... You can take the books with you. Okay. I'm sorry. Bye. <sighs> and Ellen, verging on a panic attack, remembering the details of how she is responsible for her father's death. That is the reason she has these bracers on her arms. It is the, his face swimming in her mind his last moments with her smiling at her and then the shock as she picked up the bracers and that shout of no as if he knew that something might happen all of this running through her head as she as she careens and and uh, up the stairs and back up to her room you go up the stairs and you go to what you think is your room Wrong door. She starts to, to uh, beat on the door and scratch at it. It opens. The wrong the door room, opens? It does. And you see a bathhouse. Waterfalls of iridescent water steaming hot fall from crystal cliffs green purple and blue shifting in color like much of this palace they fall into marble depressions into the floor steaming there are the sounds of faucets moving pipes creaking and at the center a fountain, a large stone statue set into this placard of stone of a woman with snakes for hair. And each one rises from the stone and becomes another outlet for the water to pour out of. It is only a face. 
but that face blinks as you enter and looks directly at you. Uh, are, are you a br- And she throws up into the fountain. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the water washes away your bile, but not the taste of it. Uh, the smell of her dad's burning flesh is still seared into her nostrils. Another uh, wave of nausea building in her body. Are you... I'm sorry. You're... Are you a bride? You have to be... I don't know what you... I don't know anything. I am indeed a bride. I'm sorry for for vomiting on you. Worse fluids have been spilled here before, my dear. And yours will be far from the last. Okay, that's not comforting. Um, um, can I, is this, I don't understand what this is. Um, and Elwyn has only ever ba- bathed in buckets in her mm. life. <laughs> she doesn't know what this place is. I am the baths, the cleansers. My name is Mira. Mira. How how did you end up a bath? What, What is your desire? My desire was to drown. And I flung myself into the waters of the palace. And that is what it took from me. Oh. It will take from you too, eventually. And you wanted to drown because you didn't want to be caged. And this curse keeps you at Forever. I am. I, I, and she looks down at the vomit covering her dress. I should bathe. I, do you watch? Or can I, is all, are all of, are all of these? Brides, just you. Right now, I'm the only bride in here. Okay. Though many come to wash themselves here. Is there a private one? Waterfall? She shuts her eyes, and her face retreats into the stone plaque. And it's flat. Her serpents hiss once, and then retreat as well. to tread lightly with my escape lest I be turned into a bath. And she tries to find the most private of these grand waterfall baths and uh, peels off her her soiled gown and, um, mm. and, and takes her first real bath of her life. The water is luxuriant and warm and perfumed. Lavender and Rose. As you enter the pool and start to wade in the warmth, the water starts to foam and two figures rise from it. Both statues, androgynous, featureless, blank faces with hands, carrying soaps, brushes, and they rise to you and start addressing your body. Scrubbing you you clean, washing your hair. Thank you. 
they don't respond. And when they are finished, they retreat back into the water. I, um, I should lay down. I should lay down. Ellen is extremely overwhelmed by everything that she's experiencing, not only mm -hmm the situation of being whisked away and cursed, but also now we have a castle that is alive and everything seems to have a face and is talking to her. So she gathers up um, the two books that she has from the library and she once again tries to find her chambers to try to sleep through the night. When you get out of the bath, the books are there, but your dress is not. Instead, there is another faceless statue who holds out a silver gown with an arm. Thank you. You take it in your hands and it's unlike any material you've ever felt before. The fabric shimmers and feels silken, but it's so thin as to almost be transparent. It covers you from neck to toe, long train, but the back is cut out low with dangling crystals. This is, this is the finest I have. I don't, I couldn't, I don't, I don't know how to wear this. Um, and she's kind of talking to the various faceless, non-moving objects around her now, trying to, to grasp at any way to make any of this make sense to her. Um, but she catches sight of herself in the reflection of one of the nearby pools and can't help but be a little delighted at what she sees because this is not the person who last looked at her from a reflection. You do look different in the reflection of the pool. Nothing like what you've seen the other brides look like, but your hair falls clean and shining past your shoulders, drying in waves. Your skin is brighter than it has been before. Perhaps this is the first time you've ever been truly clean, cleansed. The faceless statue starts to pull the dress over your head, fastening the neckline of the button at the back, and then retreats into the ground as it finishes. As you look down at the gown and the sleeves of it touch your bracers, Golden lines of embroidery start to shoot around the edge and around your neck and collar and the crystals turn gold to match. Ooh, that's cool. Well, I... I'm not really dressed for sleeping. Do I... I so Ellen wanted to rest to calm her mind. Um, mm -hmm. And we established that she does get hungry. Does she get tired? Is there sleeping here? You do get tired and you okay. are still hungry, though perhaps not as much now that you've thrown up from the <laughs> nausea, you know? Okay. Um, so despite being dressed the finest that she has ever been dressed in her life, um, Elwyn is, uh, is, is still overwhelmed and will try to at least sit down for a moment and, and again, once again, tries to look for her chambers. This time you find them. For some reason, it seems like the hallway switched sides from where you entered. It's on the opposite side of the hallway. You find your chambers and shut the door and you find on a tiny serving platter with this 
intricate curved lake work on the glass top is a meal still steaming hot, sliced turkey, gravy. Things that you had seen from your village that are familiar to you, but not necessarily things that you were able to eat yourself. Mm -hmm. There is no sign of alabaster. What do you do? I sniff the food, checking for poison, but not knowing what that would be. She it has smells no delicious. And uh, digs into the food. You dig into your food. You feel the weight of the books at your side, the weight of the palace around you. You sup and rest. And that's where we're going to take our first break. <laughs> so we'll be back in. Connie, how long are the breaks? 10 minutes. 10 minutes? 10 minutes. <clears throat> so we'll see you soon.
Hello, transplanters and new friends alike. Do you want to play TTRPGs but aren't sure where to start? Maybe you don't have a GM or players or a consistent schedule that everyone can stick to. Whatever your obstacles might be, I've got a solution for you. Start playing games. And by that, I mean the website, startplaying.games. Start Playing is the largest online platform for players to find a playgroup and professional GMs for any game system and any virtual tabletop. Over 20,000 players have found their playgroup through startplaying.games. Game masters set their own price, ranging from free sessions to paid adventures, and their search functionality allows you to sort games by system, length, schedule, and price. You can sign up with a group of friends or meet new ones through startplaying.games. Whether you're brand new to RPGs, a seasoned veteran, or just curious about what's out there, startplaying.games has you covered. Sign up for a free account today by using exclamation point start playing in chat. And without further ado, let's get right into it. Hello. Hi, everyone. Welcome <laughs> back to Glass. That's all lowercase with a period. So, a few things to go over before we get right into the action again. Uh, I just want to cover the content warnings for this episode of God Killer. So, we have fantasy violence, gore, body horror, death and killing, death of loved ones, abusive and toxic relationships, domestic horror, pregnancy and miscarriage, false transmutations, loss of autonomy, jail themes, imprisonment, Torture, blood, <laughs> gaslighting, vengeance, and potentially insects and spiders. Use exclamation point CW in chat at any time to get a full list of these content warnings. Tee hee. The way you said torture. I forget what voice I use, but. Torture. <laughs> torture. <laughs> All right. Oh, God. You ready? Mm-hmm. You awake in your new bed, silken covers over your fine gown, which doesn't seem to have creased or wrinkled while you rested. There's no way to gauge what time it is. The sky outside your window is still that same shifting green-blue shade. What would you like to do? Remember, you still have the books with you. Mm -hmm. uh, before she leaves the room, um, Elwyn's going to look into the mirror once more and flip through that same bride book and try to find um, try to find the woman with the long black hair. You'd only gotten through like F last time before the memories got to you. So you start to flip through more through images of brides, descriptions, and then you get to N. And you see a portrait, a dark-skinned woman with inky black hair, black eyes, wearing a plain black dress with a high collar. And underneath it says, Noir. The alabasters. As you say that, words start to appear at the bottom. Alabaster's other half. Domain. Mirrors. The missing half. Show me the missing half. She holds up her bracers to the mirror. The bracers start to glow with golden light. Threads, golden threads start to shoot from them into the mirror. The mirror surface starts to ripple and glow. And then a light. You feel something tugging you towards it, pulling you forward. Elwyn follows the pole. You slip through the mirror, the liquid surface of it feels 
lukewarm, as if dipping into a pool of cooling water or into a bath of someone's freshly spilled blood. On the other side, you are in a white room, no walls, no corners, bright light. In front of you is Noir, sitting in a plain black chair. She holds a hand mirror in her lap. It's gilded. She's facing you, expressionless eyes. She wears no makeup, much plainer seeming than her sister. but no less foreign, no less strange. Noir? That is my name. And you are Eloin, correct? I am. The newest bride. I saw you in the surface of the mirror. My bracers have brought me to you. And she shows. Bracers. Mm -hmm. You raise your bracers and you look at them and you see that the words are gone. And instead there's this shifting sort of like shattered effect that goes across it, like a flash to and from, as if it's trying to form words, thoughts, sentences, something. Those bracers, they are yours. Well, I found them. So I suppose they are mine now. They've you, always been yours. You know where they came from? You. They came from, well, I found them. I found them in the, in the woods. They called to you because they are of you. Well, I, 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 I am Noir, as you've said, Noir of the reflection, Noir the black. I see everything that has ever been beheld in a mirror. And she waves her hand and in front of you, a giant mirror forms several stories high. And the surface starts shifting across landscapes, different people, women looking through it and dressing their hair, people from places you've never heard of, could never imagine, people dressed in long robes of silk or in high necked gowns that are cut close to the body, rapidly shifts between them and the mirror starts to move all around you in a spiral of color. Noir, I'm looking for answers. If you have beheld everything that's been passed in front of a mirror, you might know, I, I think maybe the bracers found me so I could break this curse. The curse that keeps us all here. I, I found you in this book. Yes, the book contains all of us. You are not like the rest of us. I've seen much, but I do not know all. My sister sees little, but knows more. Did the two of you ever try to escape with your combined knowledge? I have not beheld my sister in millennia. She is hidden from me. Would you like to see her again? Maybe you could help me. Is there anything you know? 
And I won't tell anybody I talked to you. This I will bear this burden myself. You must read the book. And you must learn the truth. We are all bound here because of that. That's the only thing that can hold the answer. I'll get you out. I'll get you out of here. I'll get us all out of here. Only the will of a god can break me from my chamber here. Only the desire of a god can reunite me with my sister. Then I will do my best to convince a god. Not Egan. Who? I do not know. But Egan is as much prisoner here as we are all prisoners to his desires. I will be back for you. I promise. Rely on yourself. All of it. I'll try. And Elwyn steps back out of the mirror. The same warmth flows over your body and you step into your room and the surface of the mirror is blank save for your own reflection. Elwyn kind of feels like she's being watched everywhere she goes. So she's going to pick up the book that Noir mentioned. I'm, I'm sure it's it's the... the, the yep. um, the history mm -hmm. and um she's going to kind of uh whisper to the walls thinking they might have some kind of sentience i desire to see the garden and have a space alone to read there's a thrum around you a sort of tremble in the air in the stone as if something outside the room is turning, shifting, moving. And then it stills. Okay, so Ellen cracks open the door and lets her feet lead her to where the house might be showing how the garden is. Your feet press into soft grass and soil. The door closes behind you and then disappears. You are standing underneath the green and blue sky at what appears to be a clearing in the center of the palace. The high walls surround you on all ends in this circular garden and a bed of flowers each one made of crystal sits in front of you the flowers go off into the distance touching just sh stopping just shy of another door at the far end Does it look like the house has created a spot for me to read here, or is it leading me towards the door? You ask that question inside, and you feel that this is where you asked to be, and therefore you were brought here. Okay, so... Elwyn looks around to try to find a spot to settle down and crack into this book um, mm -hmm. And on her way, she reaches out and touches one of the 
crystal flowers. You reach out and touch one of the flowers and almost brittlely, it snaps from the stem into your hand. It's completely clear, except for tiny rays of opalescent color that shoot through it. It's a rose. And if you look closely, they're all roses. But as you hold it there, a shock goes through you. And suddenly you're not in the garden. You're sitting in a plain room, beige floors, dirt packed, a straw bed in the corner, a door on the far side, and a woman sitting by a hearth that is little more than mud stacked on top of each other to cater to flame. You see a woman with long, pale blonde hair, a youthful face, eyes round, blue, tiny lips. And she is crying, weeping. You hear the sound of horses hooves moving in the distance, wagon wheels turning. And you know that is the sound of the God of Desire's carriage come to take this girl away. And then you're back in the garden. The crystal flower shatters in your hand and disappears. Um, I would like to do another mortal move. Mm -hmm. Which one? Act impulsively. Mm -hmm. So the fear that Elwyn feels drives her to grab another rose and see if she can see more and more of the brides and glean anything from the arrival of Egan. You pick up another rose and you are in a library. Another rose, you are at the footsteps of a waterfall leading up to a temple. Another one, another one, each one a different scene, each one the carriage appears, each one shows a woman being taken away. Um, okay, I'm not sure if this is a divine move or not, but um, mm -hmm. I want to take the uh, the tome of the brides that I have, mm -hmm. so not the one that Noir told me to read, mm -hmm. and uh, smash the rest of the crystal flowers that are in front of me. You start to smash the garden, and with each one, a chorus of cries fills the air. Women's voices, the crystals shatter, fall to the ground in crumbling pieces and disappear. Nothing left behind. <sighs> Ellen, Ellen is, is, is breathing hard with the, the fear and the energy that drew her to smash all of these crystal roses and the knowledge that she can't, that this doesn't do anything to change what happened to them, what she's seeing has already passed. And um, with a renewed fervor, she um, sits down in the middle of all of the broken shards of glass around her and starts to flip frantically through this book to try to find information about the truth of what this curse might be, where it came from. You open the book and on the first page in the same gilded lettering, it simply says the truth. And then blank page, blank page, blank page, blank page. A single word appears on the middle of the next page trapped. 
The next page, cursed. And then on the next page, finally words start to appear, forming sentences. There was once a goddess by the name of Hester who embodied the land of Sai. Her beauty was the land's beauty. Her hair, its rivers. Her eyes, its flowers. Her skin, the gentle rolling fields. She was beautiful. And as everyone should know, beauty comes with a terrible price. Two gods desired her more than anything. Lyra, goddess of beauty, and Egan, god of desire. They loved with the fervor and a menace that only a god's power can give. And each one tried to win the love of the goddess, granting her great gifts, boons, anything to entice her. One day, Egan and Lyra came to blows. The war between them ravaged the land, burnt it to a crisp. And when their rage finally cooled, the land neared the form of the goddess, killed by their hands, destroyed like the land she represented. For their crimes, they were cursed, bound, trapped by their own desires. Lyra was split apart and bound to the god of desire. Her beauty, her vanity, fueled the power of his cage when he became trapped by his own impotent desires. Every 20 years, a bride is brought from every corner of existence. A bride meant to potentially be Hester's replacement, to break the curse that binds the gods and all these mortals to them. And every 20 years, it fails. Forgetting herself and losing herself to the curse, Lyra, sealed her memories away, choosing to forget. And Egan forced day after day after day to see his own desires twisted and used against him, worked against the brides themselves, slipped into madness. And to break himself from it ripped out his own heart and sealed it in the palace to never feel again. And that's where the tome ends. Owen snaps the book shut and looks to the walls of the palace garden and says, 
to the castle. I desire to see the heart. The shards of the garden that you now sit in the middle of start to rumble and shake. And light starts to pour from beneath you, rising from the earth itself is a cage, top of fountain. Crystalline glass, and inside of it, a heart, frozen. Unbeating. Elwyn walks up to the heart and as she held the bracers up to the mirror, the, um, did you say that there are different symbols? Did, did different symbols ever land on these bracers? They did, but you haven't looked at them yet. Okay. Um, well, as the bracers did give her a gateway into the mirror and had that interaction, she's going to look at the bracers once again and see if there's any kind of connection between them and this heart. The bracers say between the two of them, Through love can life be wrought anew, and through love can death be brought to a god. I need him to love. The same golden threads that pulled you towards the mirror start to curl and twist around the glass cage and the glass heart, drawing you to it. Ellen moves forward. You reach with your hands towards the cage, and as soon as the brazers touch it, it shatters. And the crystal heart, the heart of glass, beats once twice and the fountain the water of it starts to turn red do you touch it yes you reach out with a bracered hand and the heart beats rapidly in your palm Blood starts to pour over your fingertips, pooling into the ground, dark, deep, more red than any mortal's blood. The bracers start to burn your hands, feeling as if you stuck them right into a fire. <sighs> the heart thrums and grows in size, bigger, 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 until again, it disappears. And with it, your bracers. <gasps> no, 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 no. The golden light seeps away from your arms, <sighs> leaving them bare. Oh God. You stagger to the ground, your legs withering beneath you. I'm going to ask you a question, Elwyn. As this power leaves you, as this strength leaves you, who do you call out for aid? Who do you wish would help you? What do you wish would happen? What is your desire? I followed what I perceived to be a group of pixies into the forest that led me to these bracers. Mm -hmm. So grasping at anything possibly connected to the bracers, she first thinks of her dad 
and his face and his hand reaching towards her as she puts on the bracers, but then her mind shifts to those pixies, the glowing orbs that lit her way through the brush. And she calls to the pixies and thinks of them and, 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 and thinks to herself, tell me what the meaning is. What, why was this given to me just to be ripped away? I thought I was chosen. I thought I was, I thought I was here for a reason. Why? Words echo up and away into the strange sky. You see your chest starts to light, a warm, golden, glowing light. The same light you saw from the pixies. But then you remember something that Noir told you. It's you. This is you. The light spreads through your chest, through your skin, through your legs. It's a warm, inviting heat. Spreads up through your head, through your hair. And it never goes away. Your withered legs gain strength again as you rise up. One leg first, bringing yourself to your feet. It's me. The bracers are me. So they're inside of me. In the heart. Can she you feel the a second heart beating alongside yours? thrumming in your chest. I have the heart. And I can make this heart love. Maybe. I... I need to... I need to see... I need to see Egan. The same thrum. Same strange shifting gears in the air. The door on the far side lights with your light, the golden cloud. Do you go to it? Yes. You go to the door. Like all other doors in this palace, it's made of crystal and reflective. And you catch a brief glimpse at your reflection. Your hair is no longer dark, but streaked with gold. Your eyes glint with the same color. Your dress has turned the same shade as your eyes and your hair. And as you walk, flowers rise in your wake, true ones not made of crystal, wildflowers. I try to command more nature as I walk towards this door. What specifically do you want to command nature to do? You said there was a fountain? That was, mm -hmm. is it still running with blood? It's returned to water. It's just a vision. Okay. Um, I want to try to redirect that water upwards into a rain. You, for the first time, try to focus your power, and it is your power, to something outside of yourself. 
the fountain crumbles as if crushed. Water rises up into the sky and for a brief moment, lightning bright and white crackles the sky, splitting it. And the briefest moment of blue appears, a sky that you've seen many times, then turns iron gray and gathers with rain. I am, I, ha I have the power of Hester. You say that and something inside you responds. No, you are Hester. She responds to the voice inside of her. There must be a mistake. I'm, I'm, I'm Elwyn. I am from Thistle. My father's name was Cedric. I have been unable to walk m most of my life. There's this, is this, this power. I, 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 there's, there's, I, I, I don't, I can't. And, and she's, she's, her mortal brain is trying to piece together everything that's happening to her, and it's unfathomable to her that she could be a god. That doesn't make any sense to her brain. But nonetheless, she does understand that there is a, a, a an, an innate understanding that she is able to command the elements around her. These crushing, conflicting realizations make you fall to your knees before the door. The rain pours down on you, soaking through your dress, beads of it on your skin. And then you feel a hand on your shoulder, cool, almost cold. And you look up, and see Aiken standing above you. His eyes are no longer silver, purple pupils. They're warm and gold. His hair, once silver, burnished yellow, brighter than the sun. His robes, his brocade coat have fallen away, given to simple breeches, a golden chest, nothing more. Who are you? Bear that mantle. I am. I am. I am Elwyn turned Hes Hester. And I think I have been chosen to come here and help free you and free everyone here. A rolling shudder goes through again. He pulls you to your feet. He looks up into the raining sky and then back to you. Tears start to flood his eyes, but they are red, bright with blood. I don't know 
who you are. But there is no freedom from here. Lightning spears across the sky once more. Egan. I think if... If you can learn to love me, truly love me, and not just possess me, or maybe if I could learn to love you, we could, we could end this. Egan doesn't know how to love. The doorway behind you opens. And on the other side of it, you see Noir, long straight black hair, standing next to Alabaster, holding each other's hands. Their eyes are as if they are made of steel as they stare at Egan. On either side of you, Egan, tall, golden. On the other, two sisters split apart. Alabaster, Noir, stop. Stop where you are. This, this can all end. It can, it can, it can end and you can be free. We've, we've found the answer. Noir, you, you led me right to it. Noir's eyes shift to you and then back to Egan and then to her sister. And at the same time, they speak. Put us back together. Owen looks to Egan when they say that. Egan is deathly still, bloody tears still streaming from his eyes, hands curled into fists. What happens when you get put back together? Again, they speak in unison. I don't know. Why do I get the feeling something very bad will happen? Lightning pierces the sky again. The rain continues to fall. I would like to do a divine move. Mm -hmm. Which one? And challenge someone dangerous. Mm -hmm. Um. So what is the risky or foolish action you would like to take? <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I, yeah, I'm getting the feeling as Ellen also as a player, my hands are sweaty <laughs> mm -hmm. that this is bad, uh, that they're bad. Um, so, and whether or not that's right or wrong, um, that is definitely how Ellen is feeling. So um, she will, um, she will say, the answer is in love and you will not get in the, in the way of that. And she will raise a wall of vines separating her from the sisters. Mm -hmm. Okay, roll 2d6, Okay. add two to it. Okay, so I rolled an eight plus two. On a 10. You push too far. <gasps> no! The vines grow and grow and split the earth thick, ropey, and soon the size of tree trunks. They curl through the palace, breaking crystal, toppling towers. Lightning spears the sky again. And soon you stand at the center of it. A tiny pocket 
you alone within. You cannot see Egan through the vines, through the thicket, nor can you see Alabaster and Noir. Elwyn starts to scream and cry out for Egan. Uh, starts to break apart the vines. Can she... She has. She possesses the power of nature. Can she grow claws and try to cut through the vines, cut through the trunks, climb up the trunks? What would you like to do of those <laughs> options? Climb up the trunks. I forgot there were trunks and not just vines. <laughs> yeah, they're like, they're Go. really, really, really thick vines that are basically the size of tree trunks. Yeah, um, yeah. So she'll climb up the vines. You start to climb up and up and up and finally you reach a curve and you stand atop a wall of vines and you look back down into the garden and you see three figures fighting whips of light bolts of energy a golden man a white woman and a black one. You think and you remember that there were three players in this legend, mm -hmm. not four. Split apart. Lyra, this has to end. She shouts down cracking lightning into the into the fray the figures freeze all of them including Egan. alabaster looks up at you with her eyes of sea glass and in a moment she appears in front of you atop the vines You have to will us together. Another second, Noir appears. And then, Otherwise, nothing breaks. What do you mean nothing breaks? They look at each other. You restored Egan. You didn't restore us. I'm afraid of what happens if I reunite you. You fighting with Egan is what started all of this. You fighting over me, over Hester. Who's to say that won't continue? Alabaster takes a step towards you. And you choose Egan over us. I don't know. Do I have to make a choice? One by one, lights start to flicker around you from the shattered remains of the castle. A woman made of flame, a woman of ice, a face of snakes in a stone plaque, a woman more page than person, hundreds than thousands. And millions stretch before you as the castle melts away and you stand on a pyramid of brides. At the top of it, you in the center. To your left, floating in air, Egan. To the right, the sisters, Lyra, in her broken form. You know you have to make a decision. And whatever decision you make, 
It will be final. I <laughs> I want to draw them towards me firstly. Am I able to do that? They come to you. Two on one side. Gold man on the other. They look at you and askance, silent. I want to do a crucible move. Mm -hmm. Though I'm not sure which one this falls under. Um, what do you want maybe, to do? Maybe manifest a miracle. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um. I want to kiss all three of them at the same time. You stand atop the true form of the palace of the beings inside of it. On the backs of brides, stretching back millennia after millennia, a long curse started by a very simple battle for love. Proving that gods are as silly as mortals in some regards. You reach to either side of you to the beings bound to you, cursed to you. Ribbons of desire flutter from them. Their desires, their wants, their thoughts of you. You kiss Egan, you kiss Alabaster, you kiss Noir spilling your golden power into each of them, alighting them in a blaze of golden light. One by one, the brides start to fall away, disappearing until you are left floating in nothingness Egan holds your hand, squeezes once, and then he too is gone. You look to your other side. Instead of noir and alabaster, you see a woman, dark skin, green hair, one black eye, one glass green eye, Beautiful and terrible in equal measure. He wears beauty as a gown. Both cruel and wonderful. She kisses your hand. And then she too fades away. And you are left alone. The darkness starts to encroach on you. The golden light from your body starts to fade, burst from the feet, up your legs, to your torso, till you're swallowed by it. When you awake, you're in the wood again. Where your father died, but no longer are the trees blackened. No, they're tall, beautiful. And as you rise, 
You hear familiar footsteps and a call. Elowen! Elowen, it's time for dinner. Come home. Dad. Dad. And you know that for once, the gods looked beyond their desire and into yours. And that's the end of the game, people! Oh my god, that was so good! Yay! Oh my god. Holy, can I swear? Holy beep. That was yes, so good. That was fun. <gasps> oh my god, that was amazing! Can we wow. all just bow down to Persephone right now? That was <laughs> freaking amazing. I'm glad yes. that you enjoyed it. That was insane storytelling. You're a queen. I'll watch you do anything. I'm so glad I got to DM <laughs> again. It's been so long. So I'm glad oh. that my chops haven't completely faded. No, oh you spread your I'm wings so and you fucking wedding. Yeah, oh. that was so good. Oh my God, the two of you were amazing. You knocked it out the park like I Yeah, you were incredible. Win. I'm so glad that you did this with me, Jess. Oh, thank you for inviting me. I had, this is like unreal. This is so much fun. This is, it was like, oh, it was so juicy and detailed mm -hmm. and, oh. Yeah. All well, Sethi, you all it. you, Jess. Yeah, the two of you killed it. That was amazing. I know I speak on behalf of chat uh, when I say that was incredible. We were like on the edge of our seat the entire time. I was just like <laughs> munching my metaphorical popcorn. Uh, wow, the world building, like the mm -hmm. deeply, richly layered like like lore and like the reveals, right? Like like I think like it, it literally <laughs> felt like a, a stained glass painting spiraling outward with mm -hmm. all like the complexities you were laying on as, as God, as the GM. And Jess, your performance performance as Elwyn was like captivating like all the choices you're <laughs> it was making, really like, good it Thank was you. so good y'all killed it like I'm bowing down to both of you <laughs> incredible <laughs> oh my god that was incredible and uh yeah why don't the two of you like f tell folks where they can find you or they can follow you like plug your shit hype yourself up uh let's start with our incredible god killer uh Jess well I didn't even kill a god I get I mean I don't know what happened to the gods in the end but yeah we, we chose maybe you'll love. find out eventually Oh my god, I would love a sequel. Also, you need to write this into a book. Um, I <laughs> am Jess. I can most often be seen gaming on Reckless Comedy. That's on Twitch and on YouTube. And uh, also, I play Dungeons and Dragons with the Dungeon Run. And uh, I'm, all, I'm on the internet in other ways, too. But you can follow me at Jessica Lynn Parsons on Instagram or at Jessica Parsons on Twitter. I think it's in the, in the command, too, I see. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yes, hell yeah. And Sefi, tell folks where they can find you and follow you. Hi, I'm Persephone, a.k.a. Sefi, a.k.a. Persephiroth. You can find me at Persephiroth on Twitter, Twitch, and recently back on TikTok. I'm trying to do that thing again. <laughs> um, but like, uh, I stream a lot. I play a lot of video games. Um, and occasionally I get to run games. So maybe I'll be running more soon, hopefully, you know, because it's been a few years since I've done it regularly. I used to be a forever DM, believe it or not. Um, and then uh, after Dimension 20, I became a forever player. So happens. Um, I Oh, also, you can catch me every Tuesday on that Bronze Girls channel for Shakar, which is her D&D actual play, um, which is great. Um, you may know Bronze from um, uh, Desi Quest and stuff like that, which should be coming out at some point. I don't know when, but it's very cool. And I can't wait to watch it. So, uh, yeah. Uh, thank you so much for having us, Connie. Yes, absolutely. I'm letting us Thank tell you. the story. This was actually yeah. it was really cool. Um, like getting to use a system because, like, with someone that you trust, you can just go ham on the storytelling and the mechanics take a backseat, and that's kind of nice. Absolutely. I, I mean, that's a hundred percent in the spirit of the game too. Like, I've played sessions of this of where we don't touch the rules at all, but it still feels mm -hmm. very god killery, right? Like, the mm -hmm. setting was so incredible, and like. Sefi, like, this setting was so rich, and I agree with Jess, like, this has to be a book series. <laughs> it's now a novel. I, I did think... partially base this setting on, uh, like, half of a novel I wrote when I was 16, but, yeah. Well, listen, it's waiting to be finished. So, go ahead, uh, Jess. Uh, no, I was just gonna say, I'm kind of, I'm glancing through the, the God Killer moves that are in role right now, and um, it's, it's fun, because we did, we did a lot of these moves without 
verbally mm-hmm. calling them out, like yeah. recognizing a God or, you know, um, wielding a power, inflicting violence. Like these are all things that we, we did and we just kind of like organically moved through that storytelling. Yeah, absolutely. Also no miscarriage stuff. Uh, I think there was a lot more horror to this. <laughs> if there were more rooms explored, they're like, they were going to get really dark, but I'm <laughs> happy with the way that this went. Yeah, it was it was quite romantic. The 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 baths were were really cool in the garden, and yeah, you basically found like the lightest portions of this. <laughs> I, I will say, yeah, yeah. So as fucked up as ink, the... as fucked up as gothic romance like horror stuff can get, you found the like light stuff. I think yeah, we would have needed two two sessions. I think to get through Probably, all yeah. of the the dark yeah. darkest. Like things. a mini. I wrote a honestly. ton for this game and like improved a lot, but like basically, I was like. Uh, whatever you can get to or whatever you feel like exploring is where we go. Yeah. yeah. I think also you're probably just matching my energy too of like mm-hmm. where I was taking the story and absolutely. I, I guess I, I wasn't I wasn't in the in the the, the gore tonight. No, it's <laughs> I totally was, fine too. Also, I was just like, I'm not disappointed so at all. Beautiful. This went really well. <laughs> Everything's so beautiful. Yes. It went so incredibly. Like during break actually, Sefi, you mentioned a couple of the names of the other rooms that made yeah. me go like yeah. what the fuck? Should I mention <laughs> some of them? Yes. Yes, please. please. Give give our viewers a treat. Okay. Chamber of the Unborn. <laughs> the Transforming Room. Mm-hmm. The Hall of Mirrors. The Aviary. The Aviary was especially fucked up. Um what? <laughs> Not the messed up birds, no. No. Um, yeah, I, if we had more time, I, I could have found a reason to go to all of those rooms, but. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. I knew, like, it, it was never part of the plan for you to go to every room. Hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I was just like, these are some I have in my wheelhouse, and I had, like, notes on a few that I could improv, but, like, I improv actually quite a lot. Like, the library, I completely spaced on planning a library, so all that was improv. Mm. The character was improv. Oh, my God, the improv. paper yeah. woman? Yeah, all of that was improv. That was Actually, brilliant. Ex- the only like description that I really pre-wrote was the opening legend. Everything else was improv. I had like a few notes for like columns, colors, stuff like that, and that's what I used to do the description. Also, um, Persephone, kind of like we had talked about our world and the characters were the character I was building, but she still surprised me because I really came into the game expecting. Egan to be, you know, like hot, but also <laughs> a dick, I think, or like, you know, mm-hmm. kind of like a villain. And he and I really definitely was did never not, a villain. I did not, uh, I sort of let you have that expectation because yeah. I wanted it to be sort of like a, like everyone's lost autonomy. For Absolutely. This, this yeah, I love being taken so, on the ride. <laughs> I'd be like, whoa, what? <laughs> yeah, I was getting like huge Bluebeard's Bride kind of like vibes from like, very, the it's zero. very close. Yeah, yeah, Minus and like you kind of turned of themes, that on but... its head a bit. Yeah, yeah, like you like took this kind of like trope that we were familiar with, and you like give this nice twist, like this nice Seffy twist to it, right? So, oh, that was wonderful. Uh, but yeah, uh, thank you to the two of you, especially, and to everyone, of course, for tuning in mm-hmm. uh, to Glass featuring the incredible Seffy and Jess. Uh, what an incredible session with again such a richly realized world with a complicated, compelling protagonist at its core. Uh, So as a reminder, we have four more one shots left of God Killer every Saturday until May 20th. So next weekend, Saturday, April 22nd, well, your God is going to be Lexi of Black Girl Mage fame and your God Killer will be Josephine McAdam. So a taste of what's to come for next week, Josephine's God Killer will fight for vengeance against a deity of disease in an urban fantasy setting a la Constantine. And of course, as a reminder, pre-orders for the Ashcan edition of God Killer are open now, so you can nab your own copy while they're still on sale and get ready for the release in June, so you can use exclamation point God Killer in chat for that as well. And of course, a big uh, thank you to our sponsors for this one-shot miniseries, Roll App, Magpie Games, and Start Playing Games. So... Thank you all so much for tuning in tonight. We will see you next week, same time, same place. In the meantime, stick around for the raid. We are going to be raiding. Let me see if we're going to do this command right. Um, Did it wrong the first time, but right the second time. And wrong again. Uh, Hold on. (laughs) I do that all the time when I'm trying to raid. I'm just going to... Is this case sensitive? Pleasantly twisted. It's uh, Aunt PT slash Vanessa. Yeah, yeah. I'm doing my best. Uh, let's see. If I, I actually, I always it. mess up typing in hers too because Twisted has some letters yes. cut out. 
It does. Okay, yeah. there we go. I finally got it right. Uh, yeah, Stephanie, you are you and I are on like the same page as yeah. are we spelling this yeah. name right? I've I've oh, rated yes. her many times and I've always gotten it wrong every single time, at least once or twice. Yeah, so. my my butterfingers are slipping all over my keyboard here. <laughs> but yes, please send your love to Vanessa. Uh tell them how the session went. Gush about Jess, gush about Steffi. We'll see you next week. And until next time. Bye! Bye everybody. Bye!